is the blood that's actually filtered by the nephron is arterial blood. And that arterial blood is under pressure. So blood enters the kidney through the renal artery. You got me? And as you can see, as it enters the hilum of the kidney, and the hilum of any organ is where large structures enter or exit that organ, right? So the renal artery and renal vein and the ureter exit through the hilum of the kidney. And as you can see from this lovely diagram, as you get deeper and deeper into the kidney, the size of the arteries begins to get smaller. Are you following that? All right. And as you can see here, they have kind of a blown up view of the nephron. And again, each kidney has 10 to 12 million nephrons. <laughs> so watch. This is it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is where the rubber meets the road in terms of filtering your blood. This is the nephron. Now, before we begin, I gotta give you a couple of terms. Number one. Osmolarity, define it. I'm waiting. Yeah, I like that one. It's the ratio of stuff to water. You got me? Now, this is where it gets a little dicey, so I'm going to take my time. Most nephrons begin in the cortex of the kidney. The beginning part of the nephron begins in the outer portion of the kidney, the cortex. And as you can see, watch, you got what I like to refer to as the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. You ready? Now watch, as the little yellow brick road begins its journey, as you can see, it begins, the yellow brick road, begins to move deeper into the medulla of the kidney. So it starts up in the cortex and then it begins to move deeper into the medulla of the kidney. Are you following me so far? Now watch. And as you move deeper and deeper into the kidney, the osmolarity of that environment, these, the blood and the tissue of the kidney, it starts out with an osmolarity of about 300, then it moves to 600, then it moves to 900, then it moves to 1200, didn't need this line. What, what I want you to get is that as you move deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney, the environment that these little, the yellow brick roads sitting in becomes saltier and saltier. There is more stuff and less water. So if you add more stuff and less water, the osmolarity goes up. Say yes, you got that. Okay, now, that's very important. So I'm going to give you a basic overview of the nephron, and then I'm gonna get a little more specific. So there's a question on there, describe the basic structure of the nephron, am I right? Right, this ain't it. I'm giving you an overview, then I'm gonna get a little more specific. Are you ready? Okay, so watch. All of the renal arteries will ultimately branch 
and it will form an artery that moves towards this little ball of capillaries. The artery that brings the blood into this little ball of capillaries is called what? No, the renal artery was the big one. This is called the efferent arterial. And the efferent arterial is under pressure and it brings the blood, arterial blood, into this ball of capillaries. So think of this ball of capillaries is like a spaghetti strainer, right? When you make spaghetti, what do you do? You put it in a pot, you boil some water, you throw the spaghetti in there, and when it's cooked, you take the spaghetti and the water and you dump it in the spaghetti strainer, right? And the strainer should catch the big stuff and let the little stuff go through. Are you with me? This little ball of capillaries is called what? There you go. It's called the glomerulus. And in Latin, that really means little ball of capillaries. In Greek, it means the cattle are dying. <laughs> are you with me? Okay. How many people had the little Play-Doh set when you were a kid, right? You put the Play-Doh in, and then you could turn a little dial and make stars or fish or, you know, textbooks. And you applied pressure to it, and you squished the Play-Doh out. Say yeah. The more pressure you applied, the more Play-Doh came out. Say yeah, you got that. Totally with me on that. Okay. So watch. If you look at this ball of capillaries, and we're going to take a little closer view of it now. It's the ball of capillaries. So watch. As arterial blood comes into the ball of capillaries, and capillaries are one cell membrane thick, it's going to be under pressure. And it's going to create, uh-oh, here's previous learning coming at you capillary fluid pressure. And as that pressure builds up in this ball of capillaries, it's going to force water and stuff out of the capillary. You're following me. So the glomerulus filters the plasma of the blood the plasma of the blood. There's red blood cells, big or little? Big. Albumin, big or little? Big. So the only thing that gets filtered in the glomerulus is the plasma and the stuff that makes up the plasma, the small stuff. Say yes. So what's going to be in here? What's going to be in this little collecting area? It, you're going to have sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, right? You're going to have urea. You're with me. Glucose, fat, amino acids. That's the stuff that's filtered by the glomerulus. Are you with me? So if there's more pressure in the afferent arterial, there'll be more capillary fluid pressure in the glomerulus. So what will happen to the amount of fluid that gets filtered by the glomerulus? It's going to go up. So that's why when your blood volume goes up, the, your blood pressure goes up, and the pressure in the glomerulus goes up, and it forces the kidney to make more urine. That's pressure diuresis. Say yes, esis. Okay. So surrounding the glomerulus is the beginning of the collecting tubules, the yellow brick road. And it, this little capsule that surrounds the glomerulus, this is called the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule. It was named after Billy Bowman. He was sitting on his porch one day and he thought, 
I bet you there's a capsule around my glomerulus. <sighs> Are you with me? You're following this. Now watch. Watch. If your blood pressure is low, because let's say you're bleeding your own blood, what's going to happen to pressure in the glomerulus? It's going to go down. So what's going to happen to the amount of stuff that gets filtered by the glomerulus? It goes down. So that's why when people are bleeding their own blood, their urine output begins to drop. All right, now watch. This ball of capillaries is continuous. What that means is, is that the afferent arterial takes the, the blood to be filtered, and the blood that is not filtered, what's left over, leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. So the efferent arterial takes what was left over after the plasma was filtered and it leaves the glomerulus. How many people are following me? This is important. And as you can see in this big picture, the big picture, afferent arterial, glomerulus, Bowman's capsule collects what was filtered and then the efferent arterial leaves and forms a network of capillaries that surround the yellow brick road. This network of capillaries formed by the efferent arterial are called the paratubular, para, around, tubular, tubular. Say, you got that. You're with me. You're following this. Okay. So watch. When the plasma of the blood is filtered by the glomerulus, the big stuff that can't be filtered by the glomerulus leaves the glomerulus and remains in the circulation and leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. The big stuff that you should never find in your urine is what? That's, bit, that's small. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and albumin. So if you work in a clinic or if you work in a hospital where one of your jobs is to dip urine, that's a good job, by the way. What did you do today? Dipped urine. Have you ever, uh, <laughs> have you ever uh, um, done that uh, stool for occult blood, the little slides, yeah. where you have to develop them? You have to do that in a dark room. Yeah, because if you expose the crap to light, it doesn't turn out. No, I was just making that up. <laughs> what did she say? I can't even hear her. Probably good, right? What did you say? I said they don't turn the lights off when they do that. I know. I know, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I know, you might put your finger in a pile of poop. There we go. <laughs> so the big stuff should never be filtered. So if you're peeing pus, you're peeing blood, or you're peeing egg white, your kidneys are in trouble. Say so yeah. So all of that stuff is going to leave the glomerulus and remain in the blood, and it will exit the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. The efferent arterial then produces these capillaries. And now watch. Now you got stuff in Bowman's capsule, and that stuff is going to enter the first part of the yellow brick road. And the first part of the yellow brick road is the proximal closest to the point of origination or closest to the point of the glomerulus that's a starting point for the nephron and it's twisted. If you have twisted thoughts, you have convoluted thoughts. Lauren, do you have convoluted thoughts? Probably thinking about like when I'm leaving, tripping me or something, huh? That's kind of convoluted. Alright, so watch. Watch. 
in the proximal convoluted tubules, this is where the vast majority of the stuff that got filtered gets brought back into the blood. And the process of taking the stuff that got filtered by the glomerulus, it's now in the proximal convoluted tubules and bringing it back into the blood, back into the blood, is called reabsorption. So watch. If you're going to clean a closet, what do you do? You take everything out and then you decide what you're going to put back in. So what you do is you filter all of the plasma and then as it moves through the yellow brick road, the nephron decides what it, it's going to bring back into the blood. Say, yeah, you got that. So the proximal convoluted tubules, 70% of the stuff that was filtered is reabsorbed back into the blood. And it is reabsorbed isoosmotically. What that means is you are reabsorb an equal amount of stuff and water. Okay, now watch. This is important. Because of a lot of the stuff that's in the proximal convoluted tubules, a lot of that stuff has to be actively transported back into the blood. So the cells that make up the proximal convoluted tubules are loaded with pumps, right? Sodium, potassium pumps. So this is where you use a lot of the energy that's required to make your urine. All right, now watch. Now, once the vast majority of that stuff, which was reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules, you can see that the tubule begins to thin out a little bit, right? And it moves deeper into the medulla of the kidney. Say, so, yeah, you're following this. And this loop is called the loop of Don Henley. Don Henley was on stage at Summerfest, and he thought, I bet you there's a loop that's kind of thin that goes into my medulla of my kidney. <laughs> I had a student in clinical. <laughs> She's in clinical, and as an instructor said, what's this part of the nephron? And she goes, oh, that's the loop of Don Henley. <laughs> she thought it was actually Don Henley. <laughs> it's not, just so you know. got to watch what I say because people believe what I say, huh? Okay, now watch. This loop that goes deeper into the medulla kidney is called the descending loop. Then it comes back up and it forms what? What would this be? Come on, huh? That's called the ascending loop of Don Henley. And then watch it. If you see here, it's thin, and then you get this thickened portion of the ascending limb. That's important, and I'll explain that in a little bit. And then you form this wider, twisted, convoluted portion of the tubule called the distal convoluted tubules. And in the distal convoluted tubules, this is where a lot of stuff is actively secreted. So this requires energy, right? So stuff that has to be actively secreted by your kidney into your urine are, um, or is um, creatinine, the waste product, right? Um, uh, some ammonia. And this is where drugs are gotten rid of like illegal drugs, like cocaine and meth. Oh, did I? Okay, legal and illegal drugs. So watch. What happens to people's organs as they get older? They get old. Hold up. I'm going to email that to myself so I don't forget that. <laughs> so that's why 
doctors are very careful about administering medications to the elderly. So one of the things that they'll do if they're going to prescribe a new medicine and they haven't looked at a patient's kidney function is they will draw a BUN and creatinine level to make sure that the kidneys are functioning properly. Because how do you get rid of medicine? You excrete medicine primarily, almost exclusively, through the kidneys. So if your kidneys are messed up, you will start building up toxic levels of medication. That is, of course, bad for you. Say yeah, you got that. And um, this is where you also get some, um, uh, you reabsorb vitamins, right? And a lot, of, and the secretion, the secretion of these things that you have to get rid of is active. It's active, meaning it requires ATP. And one of the first things to go when you're going into renal failure are the active processes of the kidney. So that's another reason creatinine is the best indicator of kidney function because you have to actively pump that creatinine into the urine to get it out. And if that's going, building up, then you know your kidneys are failing. Say yeah. And in the distal convoluted tubules, very, very important, very important. I need a new color to illustrate this importance. I'm going to use this green color. Oh, yeah. In the distal convoluted tubules, this is where hormones take effect. And the hormones that affect the kidney, the big ones, are aldosterone, ADH, and A and P. And I'll give you the names of those as we move. All right? Now, watch. What's ever left over, what's ever left over from filtration, filtering, reabsorbing stuff back into the blood, or actively secreting it into the collecting tubules, Whatever's left over enters the collecting ducts of the kidney. And this is very important. The collecting ducts, as you can see from this diagram right here, this is the collecting duct. Many nephrons, not just one nephron, can connect to these collecting ducts. And those collecting ducts begin at the cortex of the kidney and then begin to move deeper and deeper into the medulla. And whatever's left over in the collecting ducts will enter the calyx of the kidney, the cup of the kidney, and that is your urine. And then the urine, this is the calyx is like the urine's commons area, right? They, all the urine meets there, talks about their day. How's your day? Well, I'm a little pissed off. You saw that coming too, didn't you? Look, it's like Neo in the Matrix. You just have to say it. So, and after the urine is formed, it will then travel through the ureter, peristaltically waving down to the bladder. Your bladder fills up, you get the micturation reflex, and you go, I gotta go. And then you go. Say yeah. Alright. So that's the basic structure of the nephron. But I want more, of course. So now, this is what I want. Are you ready? If you recall, I talked to you about the fact that as you move deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney, what happens to the osmolarity of that the tissue, or in this case, really the paratubular capillaries, what's happening to the osmolarity? It goes up, right? So you start out with an osmolarity of like 300, then you move to 
600, 900, and 1,200. So in this case, down in the medulla of the kidney at the Lupa Don Henley, there is a ton of stuff and very little water. You got me? Now watch. As you move up the ascending limb of the Lupa Don Henley, what's happening to the osmolarity? It is going down, right? Very important. So here we go. So as arterial blood enters the afferent arterial and then is fed into the glomerulus, the glomerulus is actually not just a ball of capillaries. It actually has slits in it that make it more porous than an ordinary capillary. This is what allows more stuff to leave the plasma of the blood and ultimately get filtered. Are you following that? So as that blood enters, the plasma will get filtered from the glomerulus and it will enter Bowman's capsule. What enters Bowman's capsule is called the filtrate. What is not filtered by the glomerulus, and that's the large stuff we talked about, that will exit the glomerulus through the efferent arterial, and then the efferent arterial forms a network of capillaries that surround the collecting tubules, and that's where reabsorption or active secretion of stuff occurs in the nephron. Now, the stuff that's reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules is done so iso, iso osmotically. And what that means is, is that the osmolarity of the filtrate is 300. When you leave the proximal convoluted tubules, what's the osmolarity of the filtrate? 300, because it's done so isoosmotically. Now, and 70% of the stuff that was filtered by that glomerulus will get actively reabsorbed. It, and most of it has to be pumped back into the blood. So the greatest expenditure of energy in the nephron is in the proximal convoluted tubules. So they got tons of mitochondria and they pump that stuff back into the blood. Now watch. Now you're moving deeper into the medulla of the kidney. This is very important. And as you move deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney, the osmolarity is going up. Now watch. What's the osmolarity of the filtrate? So as it begins to descend through the descending loop of Don Henley, it is seen in an environment that has a higher osmolarity. This is critical. The only thing that can be reabsorbed back into the blood in the descending limb is water. So where's water going to go? And why? Where's the water going to go? Where does water always move? From low osmolarity to high. So the osmolarity here is low, and as it moves through the yellow brick road, it's seen in an environment that has a higher osmolarity. So in this case, as you move that filtrate into the descending limb, this is where water is going to get reabsorbed back into the blood. And the only thing that can get reabsorbed back into the blood is water. And it will reabsorb that water until the osmolarity of the paratubular capillaries and the osmolarity of the filtrate are equal. Say yes. So watch. When you get down to the lupa, the this thing here, the little turnaround point, the osmolarity of the filtrate is going to be 1,200. It's going to be equal to the osmolarity of the paratubular capillaries. And again, the only thing that can get reabsorbed in the descending limb is water. Are you following me? Now watch. When you move up the ascending limb, the only thing that can get reabsorbed 
is stuff, electrolytes. So if you recall, can you see this? Yes, you can. Osmolarity is stuff over water. Water is impermeable to the ascending limb. If you can only reabsorb stuff, what's going to happen to the osmolarity of the filtrate in the ascending limb? The osmolarity will go down. And what happens to the osmolarity as you move up? The osmolarity begins to go down. Do you tell me you're following this, right? Now this is really important. Watch, I'm gonna do my very best to draw a picture of this guy right here. And what I wanna do is draw a cell that makes up the ascending limb. Now watch, watch, you've got the little collecting duct, then you have, I don't like that color, you have the cells that make up the collecting duct, so this is where the filtrate is, yeah, this is the cells that make up the ascending limb, and then of course you got the blood. Are you with me? You're following this. So what's the osmolarity of the filtrate at its lowest point? 1200. Are you with me? What's the only thing that can get reabsorbed from the filtrate back into the blood? Stuff. So in this case, electrolytes. So embedded in the cells that make up the ascending limb of the Lupa Don Henley, you have these protein transporters. I want this. That's a little protein transporter. And this protein transports sodium, chloride, and potassium. So watch it. And in order for this transporter to work, chloride, sodium, and potassium all have to bind to that protein. And when chloride, sodium, potassium bind to that protein, it will shuttle them into the blood. Are you following that? Who's with me? Now, when the sodium comes back in, the osmotic effect of drawing sodium in is going to pull water from the filtrate by osmosis. So what's going to happen to your blood volume when that happens? It's going to go up. How many people have heard of a diuretic called Lasix? Have you heard of that? Lasix is a loop diuretic. Guess what part of the nephron Lasix affects? The loop of Don Henley, and specifically the ascending limb. So watch. In watch, in order for chloride, sodium, and potassium to get reabsorbed back into the blood, all three of them have to bind. Lasix prevents chloride from binding. If chloride doesn't bind to this little protein transporter, what won't bind along with it? And potassium. So what's going to happen to the amount of sodium, chloride, and potassium that gets peed out because you're taking this drug? 
it will go up. And if you don't reabsorb the sodium, what's not going to follow by osmosis? So you're going to pee out sodium, chloride, and potassium, and water. That's why anyone who's on a loop diuretic, they're on Lasix, they have to take a potassium supplement. Because potassium is hard to find in food. Salt, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting salt. There's salt right there. Tell me you follow that. So when you get into clinical, you're going to hear the term if you work on a cardiology floor. Well, I'm chasing the potassium all night because doctors will order Lasix if they're in con patients in congestive heart failure. And because you just learned how that works, you're going to know that you got to keep an eye on the potassium level. Say yeah. So watch. Forget Lasix right now. What's the only thing that can get reabsorbed back into the blood in the ascending limb? Stuff. Stuff. And it's primarily electrolytes. So what's going to happen to the osmolarity of the filtrate if stuff is getting reabsorbed back into the blood? It will go down because you're reabsorbing stuff. You got me? Stuff over water, so if you lower the stuff, the osmolarity goes down. So as you move up the ascending limb, the osmolarity of the filtrate is going to go back, once it reaches this point, to 300. Now this is important. Now you got the thickened portion of the ascending limb. In the thickened portion of the ascending limb, this is where electrolytes are actively pumped. Pump. How do you spell pumped? Pump. I got it. That looks like pimped. They're actively pimped. Yeah. I saw sodium on a corner last night. <laughs> They're actively pumped back into the blood. Water's not moving. So what's going to happen to the osmolarity in the ascending, the thickened ascending limb, if you're pumping electrolytes back into the blood? The osmolarity will go down. My name is, right? So watch. So the osmolarity of the filtrate is about 100. It is very, very, very dilute. And in the distal convoluted tubules, this is where the kidney decides, am I going to make a dilute urine today or am I going to make a concentrated urine today? And this is very important. In the absence of all hormones that affect the kidney, the urine is always going to be dilute. It is the hormones that determine whether or not your urine becomes concentrated or dilute. Are you following me? Have you ever heard of a condition called diabetes insipidus? Never? Well, fine. I'm not going to even tell you then. All right. So watch. So in the absence of hormones, the osmolarity of the filtrate is 100. And you better include this in your answer. With no hormones, the collecting ducts are impermeable to water. So in the absence of hormones, the urine that you're going to make is always dilute. Are you following me? OK. What I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to explain to you how hormones affect the kidney, and in particular, the nephron. How many people are with me so far? Are you following this? All right. How many people have ever seen the movie Unforgiven? It's a guy flick. So I have. 
that's all I wanted to say about that. Here, wait. I want to show you this. See, watch. When you're motivated, you'll find a way to do stuff. Right? Wait, I hope this works. Okay, wait. Remind me to uh, plug this back in, okay?